And, uh, and we're going around running errands, and she left her keys in my truck. Well, now, because I pastor, and I have to be here a good bit earlier than, than most, most of you, than, or I get to be here a good bit earlier than most of you, uh, I leave early, and we discovered that for our marriage, now being in, in full-time ministry almost 18 years, that, uh, that the devil has less opportunity to mess with us if we ride separate. You know what I'm saying? Can, can I get an amen? You know what I'm talking about. Come on, yeah, Seth struck a chord with somebody, somebody like, oh, now he's preaching. Now he has done started preaching up in here. It's because you get up and the kids, especially if you got young kids, it would be, you know, I, I'd be out in the vehicle. Now I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me because how many of you know that uh, confession is good for the soul? I'd be out in the car honking the horn. I'm on staff. I got to be there at like, you know, at the crack of dawn, it seems like, to be able to do all the things that had to be set up when I was on staff and all the different things like that, which, which reminds me that we have an incredible team of 61 people each service that make this thing click week in and week out. And we want to show our appreciation so put your hands together for them there is it takes a lot to be able to so so we get to show up and receive the benefit of the labor of what's been happening for hours before service starts this morning but to make a long story longer i'd be out in the car i'd be honking the horn hey come on we're gonna be late i gotta teach sunday school you know and 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 she's getting we had three in three years and, uh, and so we, we figured it out and, and, and was, was multiplying abundantly, and, uh, and God was blessing. And uh, we had three in diapers in three years, so it was, uh, some people have a mortgage burning party. We had a diaper burning party whenever they got out. Of, it was an expensive habit, and, uh, but it was a, a, definitely a habit that, that needed to be developed. And, and, um, and I remember honking the horn, and come on, and we would just be fussing at each other kind of uh, getting ready to go to church and, and, and walk up in church mad, like, you're going to make me late and I'm going to get in trouble. And she's like, well, if you'd have ironed your shirt and helped get the kids ready, then we wouldn't be late. And I'm don't you talk to me like that. I'm finna go in here, you know. And, we're, and we walk up in church and they're like, good morning. Like, oh, good morning. Praise the Lord. It's so good to be here, <laughs> you know. Knowing you done fought the devil 40 different ways from Sunday just to walk in church with your spouse. Your kids are like, who are these people? They went from like literally saying Christian cuss words out the side of their mouth at each other, talking about, I tell you what, after church, we're going to talk more about this. I'm going to walk up here. You better know I was supposed to be here at 9.05 for prayer and be on the drink. You get, and, and then walking, but, oh, good morning, God, so good. And, and you know, you have that, that conversation. Well, so this morning, what ends up happening is I'm here and she calls and says, I think my keys are in your truck. I mean, that's a big deal whenever, you know, you're supposed to be here at a certain time. I was sweating her not being here uh, this morning, so she went to looking for it. Didn't take her long to figure out I was in my truck. And I didn't say, oh, baby, it's not important. They was lost, so I wanted to put forth the energy to find them. Lost things are important when we find them. If you've ever lost your key, my kids lost my key to my Toyota Tundra I had one time, and uh, it cost me $355 to get a key to crank that thing and unlock the door because they put a high price chip in it just to get over on me, I'm convinced. Uh, so you know what I'm talking about. So it's conspiracy. And lost things are important. It's a, it, he's telling the story of the lost things. And in Luke chapter 15, he tells us the story of the unfailing love of a father. It's a story filled with betrayal, restoration, and with frustration. And there's so much in this story that in the next few moments, I need you to follow quickly because we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Because already in this series, we've been talking about what it is for heroes, what it is to make a difference. And we're going to wrap this series up next week on what it is to be a part of the body of Christ. But today, I want to talk about how people can come into that body and what our responsibility is to be in the process. And I know that's just as important because from the first week of knowing that Jesus on purpose breaks down social barriers, that he doesn't pick favors, that, that he on purpose went to someone that no one else would have given the attention or the time of day to as a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. And he went to this woman at the well and changed her life. We talked about packing a lunch from the feeding, of, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. That someone, the hero of that story, yes, is Jesus, it's always Jesus. It could be Simon, it could be, it could be uh, Andrew who noticed the little boy. It could be the little boy who gave all he had. But I argue that the hero of the story is the one who packed a lunch, who was doing basically every day what needed to be done because they were faithful. God takes the faithfulness of his people and what they do every day to be able to pack the lunch for somebody else to win and to be involved in the miracle that God has for them. It's important. 
And last week, we talked about what it is to pick up your cross. When Jesus said to them in the Gospel of Mark, he said, pick up your cross, follow after me. It was one of those kind of moments where you get to say, Oh, Jesus didn't say pick up his cross. He said pick up your cross. Whatever it is, it's your calling, your purpose. Whatever things you've come through in life is God has a plan and a purpose. And even when the enemy tried to distract you and destroy you, God's saying pick up the cross that the enemy meant to, uh, to shame you on and embarrass you on and meant to put you out as a spectacle of someone who was powerless. Yeah, pick up that thing and carry it because I'm going to give you the victory. And everything the enemy has tried to do to destroy you, I've got resurrection power to equip you so that you can make a mockery of the fool that tried to ruin you. Because the enemy has a plan to steal and to kill and to destroy. But along the way in this process, I want to talk to you this morning about this story. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, we're going to start there. And this morning I'm going to do a little bit different. We're going to read in the passage and I'm going to preach as we move along. All right, if you're with me in Luke chapter 15, say, uh-huh. uh-huh. There we go, we're together. I want to talk to you in the beginning of how he left the prodigal son. Here's what it says in verse 11. It says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set all for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. How many of you know broke people get desperate? They can have things that, are, that have been given, they've been blessed, but all of a sudden they run out and they get desperate and start rethinking life. And says, so he went and hired himself out to a citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now think about going from the finest dining, from eating healthy, from eating what is good, what is tasty, to being so messed up and desperate that you're just longing just to eat pig slop and they won't even give you that. And you're starving. Can I tell you that I believe that whenever we squander our life away, that the enemy lets us get to the lowest, I'm sorry, that where the enemy wants us to get to the lowest point that we would be destructive, God can allow us to get to the lowest point so we'll look up and want to come home. That there's something about being at rock bottom that you know you have nowhere else to look up but up. And that's what happens in his life. Here's what kind of happens is, is, is I want to kind of break this down because here's exactly what has taken place when the younger son comes to the father and says, give me my share of the estate. Here's what he is saying to his dad. I want you to understand the pain that is involved in this moment. Because he comes to him and says, I want you to give me a share of the estate. Now, in those days, when did the share of the estate take place? Whenever the father had died. So he comes to him and says, I don't want to wait for you to die. I want it now. I want to be able to enjoy the wealth of what I'm going to inherit now. So basically what he's saying to his dad is, I kind of just going to treat you like you're dead. So I know it's painful, but I kind of just am saying to you that while I'm asking why you're living and saying I'm wishing you were dead, that I want your things But I'm not interested in you. And so his relationship to his father became a necessary means to blessing instead of relationship. What can I get? Not what can I get? He says, give me what is mine. And the father's response is more startling than the request because in patriarchal society in the Middle East, of where this is, whenever in Jewish culture, what has taken place here is it would be a moment where the father when a request like that is made is where the father was supposed to take the son and kind of excommunicate him from the family and say how dare you ask that of me and now i'm going to kick you out of the family and now i'm going to treat you as if you were dead that's the kind of betrayal that has happened here by him asking this but here's what the dad does is we here's what the father does the father doesn't do anything like that he simply divided his property between them and to understand the significance of this it shows that in the greek word translated word as property it means life he developed the life between them two sons the oldest to receive the majority and the youngest to receive a quarter one three quarter one a quarter but this is a wealthy man who has a lot to give 
And so he's, he's developed, he divided that up and said, here you go. So the younger brother, the prodigal, is asking his father to tear his life apart. And the father does so because he loves his son. Gave to him. Gave him what he wanted, even though he knew what he wanted would destroy him. Have you ever known someone that wanted a gift so big, but they weren't mature enough to handle it? In our society, that ain't how it goes. We want what our parents and grandparents worked their whole life to get. Instead of work, saving and paying for it, we finance it and strap ourselves where we are living as a slave to society. But that's a whole nother sermon. So what happens is we want to live a certain way. We want to look a certain way. And the father, instead of saying, get out of my family, I want to treat you like you were never my son. I'm going to ask communicate. He gives him what he asked. Why? Because people will usually excommunicate someone from the family because if they diminish their relationship, it will diminish the feeling of rejection that they have. If you act like you never cared about them, then, it hurt, then, then the hurt will be less because you could pretend like it was no big deal. But it bothered this dad. And here's what happens, as we've read, is in those days, what, so he tore the father's life apart, and it says in those days he understood that in their customs, because of embarrassment that he had caused, that he was pretty much dead to the family. Now the son, because the culture understands what he's done, so that's why he's willing to go and hire himself out as a slave, as a citizen to a country that is absolutely ungodly. Living in the world and all it has and all its benefits, and now that it has made him the mockery, and he's in a pig style just trying to eat what the pigs will eat, but they won't even give that to him. He has this shift. See, commentators say that during the time for a son to be received back in the family meant that he would have to restore back what he would have squandered. So after he's wasted everything, can you imagine his father receiving him back in the family? Can you imagine him receiving him back in the family and saying, not only I've already given you what was rightfully yours, even though you wished I was dead, but now you're coming home? When you are lost and you are lonely and you know that it was your fault, one of the hardest things that you ever will decide to do is to come home. Because the enemy feels like it has such a grip on you that you can't even think straight. And you start justifying all the things you've done. Yeah, well, you know, my dad told me that this would mess me. Oh, my dad told me this wasn't good, but my friends are okay, and, and my friends have been successful. And what you end up finding is they're not as successful as you think they are. And maybe your dad, maybe your parents, maybe the elders in your life had more sense than you gave them the credit of having. The older that I get, the more correct I know my parents were when they told me, son, your 17-year-old friends don't know everything. I'm like, uh, well, they, they, they got a nice truck. <laughs> oh, they do? Yeah, that their parents paid for, dummy. It's amazing. In teenage culture, I'm like, I want a fine house, a nice car, and a big, and, 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 a, and a boat, and a, like, you thought about getting a job <laughs> to pay for those things? No, because they just want to get, they just want to receive. And so what happens is he's, he's having this rehearsal in his return as he's in the pigsty where he never should have been in the first place. May I remind you? And he says, if he would just make me like one of his hired hands, because he thought the best he could do because of his decision that he had made was to become one of the slaves of his father's house, a hired hand, just a commoner, no longer a son. Let's look at the second part. Let's look at how he came home. Verse 17 says this. It says that when he came to his senses. Have you ever prayed for somebody to come to their senses for a long time? And you're like, Lord, let them come to their senses. Can I tell you that this story is living proof when Jesus tells it? Is this just as much meant to, just as much meant to be inspirational to us? To say, oh, anybody can come to their senses. Like, they're never going to learn. They're never, I'm telling you, everybody, as long as they have breath in their lungs, has the ability for them to come to their senses because the Holy Spirit can do a work that no man can do. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Now, this man had an inheritance that he had a ton of money. What happened? He didn't have the maturity to handle the wealth that he was given because he wasn't conditioned to be a steward. He was conditioned to be a squanderer. He didn't understand responsibility. He didn't have the maturity to make the right decisions, but it had destroyed him. He said, look, even my father's hired servants got it better than me. And I had way much more money than them. 
He said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Now, Jesus telling this story is making the, the combination that whenever you sin against your father, you sin against heaven as well. Because if you can't obey the simplest authority set up in your life, how in the world are you going to obey God? As a youth pastor for so many years, I'm like, I can tell your spiritual maturity by the way you obey your parents. I'm like, oh, that doesn't got rude this morning. The parents are like, they're not going to say anything. They're like, come on, stir it too. That's good. Free, 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 free. They don't want to say it too loud because they don't want their kids to hear them. So they're like, uh, the, he called, they called up the preacher, told him to preach on this this morning. We was fighting on the way to church, you know, that type. But the truth about it is, is we want, how can we obey someone we've never seen when we can't obey the simplest authority God's placed in our life? And so what happens in this moment is he says, I've come to my senses. I want to, I want to come home so he got up and he went to his father it says but while he was still a long way off down a long dusty country road in verse 18 when he said i'll set out and go in verse 20 it says he got up and went to his father it says but while he was still a long way off the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him he ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him it's not quite the welcome he thought he was going to receive And he says to his servants, the son said to him in verse 21, Father, I've sinned against you, heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And 22 is a powerful verse. It says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Verse 20 says he got up and went to his father, but while he was a long way off. I want you to understand this, that how many days had the father looked down that long, dusty road, longing for the day that he looked like he could look and, and see just in a distance. How many people walked down that road that he could have easily mistaken for his son? Because the heart of a father longs for the moment that no matter how rebellious or goofy a child has been, they long for the day that that kid comes home. And he's looking, how many years, how long, how long is the season that he looked? Do you think he ever had nights where he stayed away praying, God, work in my son's life. Lord, do a work that only you can because I tried my very best to love him and it wasn't enough. There's something messed up in his mentality, in, in his psyche, in the way that he thinks. But Lord, only you can do this work. He didn't go and try and guilt him, didn't try and buy his love back, didn't say, if you'll come home, I'll give you your vehicle back, didn't do any of that stuff. He said simply, Lord, I'm just going to look and I'm going to wait. Because he needs a work that only you can do. And for a season, he looks down, the way that his son must have felt whenever he begins to go down that road, it says that the father ran to him. Can I tell you that in those days, in customs, you got to understand this. As a general rule, see, the father sees him and runs to him. As a general rule, distinguished Middle Eastern patriarchs did not run. Children might run. Women might run. Young men might run, but not the dignified, distinguished father because he is not supposed to because it is undignified. But whenever what has been lost decides to come home, he wears a robe. The one thing that we think, it wasn't like the father had on track shoes. It wasn't like he put on some running shorts and a dry fit shirt to run out and meet his son. He was in robes. He was in a robe, and so was his son. And probably a messed up, dirty, pigsty robe, holed up from the life that he <coughs> had lived. And now, in this moment, whenever the father sees him, he becomes undignified. Because I don't know if you've ever tried to run in a robe, but it's very difficult. He was willing to become undignified, not just in the way that he ran, but he grabbed the bottom of his robe and pulled it up above his knees and took off running so he didn't trip and fall. He was willing to become undignified, lift up his robe, and run with everything he had to his son. Now, is that a different response than you think he expected? The rejection that he felt. Can I tell you that whenever the son decides to come home, there's nothing that the father won't do to get to him. So many times we want God to make that step to us. God come to, but, but see, God has already made that step to us because he's given us an inheritance through Jesus Christ. 
And now what he wants us to do is take a step down that long, dusty road of coming home. Though we've been rejected, though we feel like we'll be rejected, though we feel like that we've done too much for God to forgive us, that he patiently sits waiting for us to take that step down the road towards him. And when we do, the dignified becomes undignified and runs to us with a robe pulled up to brace us and hold us against his chest and said, my son has come home. Do you want to know why all of heaven rejoices whenever that which was lost has been found? Because it's the greatest miracle that heaven can deliver to the face of this earth. It's better than paralyzed people being healed. It's better than deaf seeing and I mean than deaf hearing and blind seeing. It's better than all of that stuff because only Jesus can take a life and restore it and rebuild it to what it's supposed to be. Medicine can make someone healthy, but only Jesus can restore soul. God runs to him. The story, this man, the father, runs to his son, pulls into his chest. See, the son has already played the plan out in his mind. This is how it's going to go. But whenever the dad grabs him, pulls him in his chest, and says, get the best robe in the house. See, it's possibly it could have been his father's own robe, because that was the best. It was an unmistakable sign of a restored standing in the family. And the father was saying, I'm not going to wait until you've paid off your debt. I'm not going to wait until you've duly groveled before me. I'm not going to sit there and, and, and wait for you to go, I'm a failure. I've done so wrong. I've sinned. I'm the worst person ever. And yet, I don't even want to tell you all the bad things I've done. I don't even want to. No, no, no. He said, oh, oh, you made the step. You came home. That's what I've been praying for. That's what I've been waiting for. You made the step and you came home. Let's throw a party. The fattened calf. See, the fattened calf was reserved for the highest of honor. He said, essentially, here's what he said to the son. He said, I'm going to not just simply take you back, but I'm going to cover your nakedness, your poverty, and your rags with robes of my office and honor. See, it wasn't the response you thought you received, but let this be a lesson that when that has been lost makes the first step, we come running. Why? Because it's our job to be like Christ whenever someone makes a step to come home. Now, the third part of this is his reception. I'm sorry, in his reception, here's what happens. He says, I want you to, to prepare a feast, fattened calf, that uh, is the special meat of the household. And there's music, there's dancing. It was a celebration not just for the family, but the whole community. Because how many of you know the whole community is affected whenever your kid goes lost? Can I tell you that God spares nothing in the expense of your return? Nothing. He spares nothing in the expense of your return. Now, the third part of it that we have to understand, which is really instead of the prodigal of the lost son, it would be called the prodigal of the lost brother. But the one who was said to be lost really wasn't the one that was lost. It was the one who stayed home. It says in verse 25, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he was near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son, just for the record, I've eaten goat in Africa. And, uh, and, and we had someone come and slaughter right behind our tent. And we deboned that thing and cooked it. We made a stew with it. We did all of that and we cleaned it good. But then I ate some goat in some other villages that still had goat hair on it. And that was a little bit difficult. So for me, I don't want a goat to celebrate with my friends. I'll take the fattened calf. Come on, somebody. There was. He says, but when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. Do you, do you see how the older son is saying, I want to remind you of what he's truly done. Is, isn't it funny how we can pick up offense for somebody else when it was their position to be offended and not ours? He says, he's, he's, he's squandered it with prostitutes. He's going to come home and you kill the fattened calf for him. You've never even given me a goat. And verse 31 says, the father said, my son... You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. See, even though both sons are wrong, however, the father cares for them and invites them both back into his love and feast. 
He doesn't say, how dare you have this attitude? I can't believe you would think like this. He still shows love to him. See, both equally wrong, but one is not equally dangerous. See, one of the ironies of this parable is now revealed because the younger son's flight from the father was crashingly obvious. But when he had left, the the father literally, physically and morally, the older son stayed at home, but he actually was more distant and alienated from the father than his brother was. See, the elder brother obeyed to get, not because he loved. See, religious don't obey God to get God for themselves in order they want to resemble Him, love Him, know Him, and delight in Him because they think if they have that appearance that they will get all the blessings that God has. So religious and moral people can be avoiding Jesus as Savior while they put on a robe that looks righteous, but on the inside, they're morally decaying. See, he feels like he has the right to tell the Father how the robes, the rings, and the livestock should be divided because he's been there and been faithful. So in essence, he's telling the father who is truly in charge how things should be done. See, God never leveraged the older son to have authority over the father or to put him in a position where he thinks that the dad owes him. So Jesus, in his life, to put it in modern terms, may have been his helper, may have been his example, and even his inspiration but he would have never been his savior because he was serving himself. He was merely connected for the benefit of what it meant. And instead of celebrating, he became jealous. Why? Because he was religious and religion makes you a slave. Today, as I get ready to close, I want to ask, well, who's the hero of the story? I believe there are two. I believe the hero of the story obviously is the father who had every right to excommunicate. But whenever he's seen, when he looked down the road and he's, do you know that the father understands how their child walks? As a parent, you understand this. You can walk into a crowd from a distance and you can say, there's my kid. April can walk in and spot Gavin from a mile away. There's old big head like his daddy. Big old head. I see that big old head. Got a lopsided over. You know, you kind of see. He had a walk to him, a way that he. But one of the things, it's to me, the hero, and the way that he's a hero is, is he didn't make them feel any more guilt than they already felt. Can I ask you this? Are you more like God whenever you prove a point, or are you more like God when you make the difference? Can I tell you that he was a hero because he waited? And he watched. He had to be studious in the opportunity to see his son walking down the road. For that, I believe, is a hero because he never gave up. Never quit watching and waiting. But see, I think the second hero of the story is the son. The younger one. The prodigal. Like, what in the world can make this guy a hero? stay with me a minute I believe he's a hero because I believe a hero has the courage in their life to admit when they've been wrong listen to me in my life I've known a lot of people that fit this story but pride has so gripped that they won't say I've been wrong I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven see a lot of times we think that we've just heard other people the truth about it is we've heard the heart of God because he's gave so much he's given so much for us and for us to surrender our life and obedience means that we have to admit that we've been wrong whenever I came to Christ it wasn't that like well you know were you that bad of a person depends on who you ask I mean in my core circle there are a lot of people who thought I was a good guy I mean I I helped old ladies cross the road. If they spill their groceries out of their plastic bag that never holds enough, that isn't built to hold that many cans, if it's spilled, I'm going to stop and help them. I'm going to let them have a parking spot. I'm going to be nice. I say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, because my dad had taught me if you didn't say sir or ma'am, then, then uh, I'll break your jaw. It's just the way he was. He was old school. I still say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am to people that are younger than me. They're like, oh, quit doing that. I'm like, sorry, it's a good habit. 
I think it's better than uh huh, yeah, whatever. You know, and so I'm not saying it's godly. I'm just saying there's something on the inside of me wants to do a flying Superman punch whenever my kids say something like that. It's one of those things where, where this is happening and, and there, is, there is a moment where there's this admitting that you've been wrong. Can I tell you the biggest step of courage is not boasting of what you've done right. It's being humble enough to admit where you've been wrong. Can you imagine... Think about it. This is what happens. We're too embarrassed of how other people are going to make us feel. Everybody knows what I've done. Everybody, Number one reason that people say they don't come to church, well, everybody knows what I've done. Well, you know what? Everybody in there is a hypocrite. Well, it didn't keep you from shopping at Walmart, going to the football game. It didn't keep you from... I think if a hypocrite's ever going to come to the right place, churches ought to be where they are. To have a chance to say, hey, I've been wrong, but I want to be right. And the victory of the story is that he had the courage to admit he was wrong. And he was restored. But if they're the heroes, then who's the zero? Obviously the older brother. Because the older brother was glad he was gone because now he could receive all the attention. And the older brother focused on what he didn't have whenever the young son came home instead of celebrating what he never lost. Do you understand? He never lost any of his inheritance. His inheritance was was greater than what the younger brother ever would receive. Even if his brother was restituted back, it was still only a half and not three-quarter. The oldest had a three-quarter inheritance coming his way, and he never knew what it was like to betray his father. I want you to think about that for a minute. He never had to put his father through the pain of saying, I wish you were dead. Give me what's rightfully mine, and I'm going to go waste it on the world's ways of this living. And instead of focusing on what he re- he still was able to have his belly full, the blessing of his father's house, all these things, but he wasn't concentrating on that. He was concentrating on what he didn't get, the attention he didn't receive. Can I tell you that I think it's where the American church is in a dangerous position? It's whenever we become the older brother that can't celebrate when the lost brother came home. So today I want you to know this. Number one, You can always come home. There's nothing you've ever done too bad that Jesus won't forgive you and restore you. There's nothing you could have done. I don't care if you've been immoral. I don't care if you've been, if you've betrayed. I don't care if you've hurt. I don't care if you've been a dry. I don't care if you've been an adulterer. I don't care if you've been a drug addict. No matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how you wasted and squandered your life away. All you got to do is say, I had it better in my father's house and I just want to go home. It's an old story that we know most of us have heard the story Tyler yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. The daughter goes away, gives herself to prostitution in the big city. It was not how she was raised. It was not how she was taught. And one day she calls home, leaves a message on the machine and says, I'm sorry you're not there. This is your daughter. I just want to come home. I just want to come home. I'm going to head that way. And if it's okay for me to come home, just put a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree in the yard. So what happens? The story tells us that they didn't just tie a ribbon around the one in the yard, that they got all the neighborhood involved and they tied ribbons around every tree in the neighborhood. Can I tell you, that's the kind of reception that God wants to give us when we decide we're through messing up our lives. We just want to come home. We ought to celebrate. Oh, that's right. They better come home. They terrible, horrible people. Well, they come home. You never, you can always come home. And to those of you today, the second thing I want you to know is you're praying for that prodigal. You're praying for somebody. Don't give up. Don't give up. You never know when they're going to come to their senses, but when they do, it'll be obvious and you'll see them coming. And when you see them coming, because you hadn't give up, you'll become undignified. You'll squall like you hadn't squalled. You'll snot bubble, lick it off your lips, so messed. You'll become so undignified, it's embarrassing. But you won't care because what was lost has been found. And the last thing is if you've already come home and you're not giving up, I want to challenge you today as I close. Learn how to celebrate someone else's victory. What does that mean? When somebody else gets a win in the kingdom, celebrate it. Don't tear it down. Why in the world? Can you imagine? Why in the world? Would someone ever want to come into the church house 
and receive as much criticism as they ever did out there. The man, I made a decision to follow Christ. I came to church and now I hear all this backbiting about all the things that blah, 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 blah. I'm like, man, I kind of expect it from the world, but the church? Why? Because the older brother's always in the church. You can tell when your heart's right with God. Is instead of being jealous of what God's doing for someone else, you'll become encouraged. Because why? When God blesses your brother or your sister, you're happy, not jealous. Because you understand that blessing benefits you because you prayed. That blessing benefits you because they win. And when they win, we all win. We're not in competition. It's not about who has more, who has less. It's about the body becoming what Jesus Christ has called it to be. And that's restored and reunited with the Father so they can live out purpose in their life no matter how much they've jacked it up in the past. Instead of seeing where they're going to miss it, start thinking about how they're going to make it. And you learn how to celebrate someone else's victory. Justin Grace was a friend of mine in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I remember how he was critical of everyone else. Every time they did something, well, you know, I could, if I had that much money, if, I, if my group had that much money, we could do the same. And he sat me down one day and he said, Johnny, you know how I know that I love you? I was like, all right, I hope this isn't too awkward. Because another dude sets you down and tells you that, you don't know what they're going to say. So you know how I know I love you? I was like, nope. Because when you win, I celebrate it. And it made me think about all the times that I'd ridiculed and been critical of someone else because of their win because I didn't have it. And I said, it did something to me to go, you got to celebrate, not be critical. Stand with me today.